Are we well this evening? Amen. So in my last message, I spoke regarding the life that was in Christ. In this message, I intend to speak about the death and suffering of Christ. Uh, Brother Andrew, thank you for that prayer. So I'm going to begin by reading a quote from the Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, page 83 and paragraph 4. The Desire of Ages, page 83 and paragraph 4 says this. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more con constant. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. The first thing I want to bring out about this topic is that before the incarnation of Christ, it was impossible for the Son of God to die. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2, we see descriptions of the Son of God. And there's a difference between the Son of God in Hebrews chapter 1 and Christ Jesus in Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, this is what it says. Speaking of Christ. Who being the brightness of his glory. And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the power. By the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made what? So much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now notice Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says this. But we see Jesus. Who was made what? A little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Amen? Amen. In the Desire of Ages, page 22, paragraph 2. In 23, paragraph 1, this is what it says. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which had been kept in silence through times eternal. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan, and of the fall of man through the deceptive powers of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, 
but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice this. This was a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus might have remained at the Father's side. He might have retained the glory of heaven and the homage of the angels. But notice this. But he chose to give back the scepter into his father's hands. What does it mean that he chose to give back? It means it was given to him, right? Amen. And stepped down from the throne of the universe that he might bring light to the benighted and life to the perishing. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import was heard in heaven. From the throne of God, lo, I come. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But what? A body hast thou prepared me. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. In these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been hidden from eternal ages. Christ was about to visit our world and to become incarnate. He says, a body hast thou prepared me, and he appeared with the glory that was his with the Father before the world was. We could not have endured the light of his presence. It is imperative that we understand that the Son of God died on the cross. He died on the cross to save you and I. It's also imperative to understand that Jesus had no power of himself to bring himself back from this dead. But he put all his trust and faith in who? His father. Romans 6.23 tells us this. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here is the question. What death did Christ die? Here's the answer. Christ died the death that you and I deserve. Notice this. In Romans chapter 6, we're going to read verse 3 and 4 and verse 9 and 10. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of who? The Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Knowing that Christ be raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Christ died the death of a sinner. Now hear my next words very carefully. 
although he did not receive the full penalty of the second death, he tasted of the fullness of it. Isaiah 53, verse 1. And we're going to go to verse 8 and verse 9. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with who the wicked and with the rich in his death he died the death that we deserve amen because he had done no violence neither was there any deceit in his mouth verses 10 to 12 yet it pleased the lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall what? Bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion, divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with who? The transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What death did Jesus die? The death that we deserve. Let's go to Psalms chapter 88. We're reading from verse 2 to verse 9. The word of God says, Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. Who's speaking through the psalmist? It is Christ. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and what? I cannot come forth. You see, the death of Christ is very important. Because as Christ died, the spirit of prophecy tells us that Christ could not see past the portals of the tomb. In this death that he was about to die, he had to put all of his faith 
and his trust in his father. Because that which he had, right? Remember, before the incarnation, it was impossible for him to die. However, he gave up one of the benefits of deity so that he could come here and give his life for us. There's many people that say Christ was God and God cannot die. But everything Christ had, he received from the Father. So if he received it, does he have the right to give it back? Yes, absolutely. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 42. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 42. Did Jesus continually petition the throne of grace and mercy? Absolutely. It says he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, what? Thy will be done. Mark chapter 14, verse 34 to 36. What did he say? And saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what? What thou will. The weight of our sins, our shame, our grief, our guilt, our pain, our sorrow was fully felt by Christ. Our Savior would have died in Gethsemane if it were not for divine aid. Luke chapter 22 and verse 43 and verse 44 says this. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The weight placed upon our Savior was unimaginable. It was immense. It was incredible. Notice what Desire of Ages, page 686, paragraph 3 says. He went a little distance from them, not so far, but that they could both see and hear him, speaking of the disciples, and fell prostrate upon the ground. He felt that by sin, he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it this agony he must not exert his divine power to escape as man he must suffer the consequences of man's sin as man 
he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. Paragraph four. As the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto, he had been as an intercessor for others. Now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature, he would be unable to endure the conflict with the powers of darkness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. Behold him, contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground, as if to prevent himself from being drawn farther from God. The chilling dew of night falls upon his prostrate form, but he heeds it not. From his pale lips comes the bitter cry, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet even now, he adds, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. In this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembling in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour. And the mighty angel who stands in God's presence, occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hands, but to strengthen him to drink it. With the assurance of the Father's love, all Christ had to rely on was the promise that he was given by his Father. He came to give power to the divine human suppliant. He pointed him to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his suffering. He assured him that his father is greater and more powerful than Satan, that his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan, and that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. He told him that he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. For he would see a multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. Can we imagine what Christ went through? Not at all. Christ's agony did not cease, but his depression and discouragement left him. The storm had in no wise abated, but he who was its object was strengthened to meet its fury. What complaint do we have in the light of what our Savior went through? Yeah. 
This very crisis makes Christ sufficient to be our comforter. Amen? It was in this manner that the Savior was burdened. It was in hellish agony that he bore this weight. And it was in this manner that Christ died. Matthew ch chapter 27 and verse 45 and 46. Listen to the cry from the Savior's lips. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land onto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In John chapter 16, verse 32, listen what Jesus said. Jesus speaking here, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So why did he cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because sin had created such a gap between him and God that in his human nature, he could not see past the portals of the tomb. Desire of Ages, page 693, paragraph one to paragraph two. This is what it says. The Savior trod the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with him. But what? God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved son, they would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. Desire of Ages. Page 753, paragraph 2. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him 
of the father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. What is the wages of sin? What kind of death? Eternal death. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. All that comprised the life of Christ slept in the tomb. Christ, the Son of God, died for us. The third volume of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 203 in paragraph 2, says this. The Spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body. It did not wing its way to heaven, there to maintain a separate existence, and to look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had taken flight. All that comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with his body in the sepulchre. And when he came forth, it was as a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. Notice. Who had control over this situation with Christ? The father. Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. We can begin at 45. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. What did that symbolize? What did that veil symbolize? The flesh of the Son of God that was torn for you and me. The tearing of that veil symbolized the fact that the way was made for us to come to God boldly. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. It's important for us to understand that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the literal Son of God who received everything of his Father. He sacrificed so much to save us. The very idea of the Trinity robs God of a son sacrifice. Romans chapter 6, verse 5.
Or if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. How many of us know that when we die and we come forth, that the Father has preserved our characters and will return them to us at the resurrection? It's the same thing he did for the Son of God. Sister White says divinity did not die. Right? And according to my understanding, divinity is equal to the character. When we come forth from the tomb, praise God. Praise God. In the beginning, I mentioned that Jesus did not suffer the full penalty of the second death. Because that penalty belongs to who? Satan. In the end, all of the sins confessed in the sanctuary, Christ will take and place upon the scapegoat. And he will suffer the penalty of the second death. The wages of sin is death. And not just the first death, but what? The second death. Eternal separation from God. Brothers and sisters, we have a Savior who gave so much, so much to purchase you and I. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour in the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our most gracious Father in heaven, what a love. Oh, what love that you have for us. That you could send your son to die in such a terrible manner to purchase me, oh God, me. Father, we are so unworthy But your love is so unending that you did it anyway. You turned rubbish into glory. And oh God, you are worthy to be praised. Father, we thank you that through the life of Christ, the death of Christ, that we could experience both the life of Christ and the death of self. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. For there was nothing that we could do to recommend ourselves to you. All of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And I pray, I pray and claim the promises of God that he that begun a work in us will see it through to the end. I desire to be molded, to be shaped, to be fashioned in the likeness of the character of the Son of God. And I know that everyone represented here desires the same. 
So, Father, help us to die that death to self and receive the gift of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Amen.